Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about electrical wires, boxes, and connectors. And we'd like to thank Bill Pollard for liking and sharing the podcast. In 1892, Thomas Edison received a patent for insulated, waterproof, and fireproof wires for residential use. Hmm. And he knew if his electric lamp was going to be a success, he needed to create a lamp core that wouldn't electrocute people and set the house on fire. (laughs) And in the 1940s, metal conduit became popular to run wires through, and this added safety. And then the conduit was used as a ground all the way back to the service panel. Right. It wasn't until the 1960s where plastic sheathed wires or non-metallic cable took off Hmm. everywhere except Chicago and Seattle, (laughs) which still like the the conduit. And Romex, so non-metallic sheathed cable, was invented by the Rome Wire Company in 1922, Mm -hmm. and most people still call it Romex. Interesting. For your electrical projects around the house in most of the country, you're going to be using non-metallic cable, and most people are going to be calling this Romex. The cable is going to have one or two hot wires, a neutral wire, and a ground wire. And the individual hot and neutral wires are going to be covered with a plastic vinyl insulation. Right. The ground wire has no insulation, so it's going to be bare. And all of these wires are going to be enclosed in this thermoplastic sheathing. So Mm -hmm. this is creating a cable. So you have a group of wires all connected. Your hot wires are black and red. The neutral wire is white. And the ground wire is bare copper, or depending on what you're getting, it could be covered with green insulation. Exciting. You want to be careful not to kink non-metallic cable and create smooth turns and bends rather than bending too sharp. If you kink the cable, you can actually damage the copper wires and cause it to overheat. Mm -hmm. When you're running non-metallic cable through studs and joists, you want to drill a 5 8 inch hole, and you want to keep the front edge of that hole an inch and a quarter back from the face of the framing material. Okay. So let's say you're going through a stud or a joist. And then when you're making turns at corners, you want to allow enough cable to have a rounded loop between the studs. Mm -hmm. If the hole you created is less than an inch and a quarter, or just to be safe, you can use a metal nail plate on the face of the stud or the joist to prevent a nail or a screw from hitting the cable in the Mm -hmm. future. Say you're putting up a picture. And this nail plate is just a flat, thin, rectangular piece of metal with teeth or little barbs that stick out of it. And you just pound it on the front of your 2x4, let's say, mm-hmm. and that's going to prevent it from getting nicked in the future. See, this is what really scares me about non-metallic cable. Right. Because, I mean, what is it doing back there? And I mean, Just sitting and waiting. <laughs> waiting for you to tie into it when you're cutting it. Because you don't know where people put it, right? Yeah, it's, it's difficult, especially if somebody's remodeled like you're in an existing home or you move into an existing home right. that's not new construction. Who knows what the previous owner has done behind the walls? This is why I like conduit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like here in the Chicago area, I mean, right. I'm, I'm like for years, all I ever dealt with was solid metal conduit. Put your wires inside or flexible metal conduit, right. and you don't care if you drill through your drywall. I mean, it's going to hit that metal, and you don't worry and about you stop. that. Right? <laughs> yeah, you hear metal, you stop screwing. <laughs> If you're going to be running multiple cables, let's say through 2 by 4 studs, there's a maximum size hole that you can create. So if you have a non-load-bearing wood stud that's 2 inches by 4 inches, the maximum hole size is 2 and an eighth. Hmm. If you have a load-bearing 2 by 4, an inch and 7 sixteenths is as big as you can make that hole. How do you know if it's load-bearing or not? You know, just make it an inch and 7 (laughs) sixteenths and don't worry about it. And then let's say you don't want to use a drill and cut holes through the studs. Mm -hmm. If you want to just notch the face of the 2x4, in a 2x4 that's non-load-bearing, you can notch it 1 and 7 16 inch deep. Mm -hmm. And if you have a load-bearing 2x4, or let's just say all (laughs) 2x4s, it's 7 8 inch deep. And then you would always put a nail plate over these notches. So if you're just notching the front... Safety first. Right, notching the front of 2x4s, and you're just going to run your cable through that, Mm -hmm. that's how deep you would notch. It. And when you're running a cable through a group of studs, you want to allow a little bit of sagging between the studs. You don't want to pull this wire tight and overstretch it. Right. Again, we can cause it to overheat. It's still so crazy that it's just like hanging in between right, the right. studs. <laughs> 
And you always want to use plastic staples to hold your cable on vertical runs, and they're going to have one or two small nails to hold them in place. And you want to match it to your cable. So mm -hmm. get a, so if you have 14-3 cable or 12-2 cable, you want to use staples that are designed for that thickness. And then you want to make sure that you're putting them about four feet apart, and you don't want staples any further than four foot six inches apart. Mm -hmm. And then if you have electrical boxes that you're running cable to, you want to staple within eight inches of that electrical box, and you want to create a rounded shape from the box to whatever the framing is that you're connecting. You don't want to again. You don't want to kink it. Mm -hmm. You also so these staples are going to be by all the wire connectors. Right. And the, that section? Yeah, that's where they're going to merchandise it in most hardware stores. When you're running a cable into an electrical box, you're going to remove that outer insulation to expose the individual wires. Right. And then the hot and the neutral, they're going to have their own insulation. You want to keep about a quarter of an inch or a little bit more of that sheathing in the box. And that sheathing is actually going to help grab, depending on the type of electrical box. Right. So you don't want to strip it all the way. You can put more pressure on the wires. And each wire should extend about three inches past the front edge of the box. Or another way to look at it is from where it enters an electrical box, you want it about six inches longer where, from where it enters. Hmm. And a lot of electricians like eight inches, which I like a little bit longer because then you can cut it and, and adjust. If you screw up when you're stripping your insulation, give yourself room. Right. You can always cut it back a little bit. How do you remove the outer sheathing? So I would use That's a. That's a weird word. Yeah. <laughs> So I would use a cable ripper uh -huh. rather than trying to use a utility knife or diagonal pliers. Mm -hmm. Like with the diagonal plier, you know, unless you're a professional and you've just done it so much, it's too you're hard. You're not listening to our podcast. <laughs> yeah, so don't use <laughs> diagonal pliers or utility knife because it's too easy to damage the wires underneath. Right. And a cable ripper, you have two, I mean, they're very inexpensive. The really cheap ones are just, you know, it's almost a, a very thin metal that's hinged and it just closes on itself. It is a very tiny blade that just cuts through the outer sheath. So and it kind of looks like tongs. Right, exactly, yeah. And with those tongs, let's say the hinge side has a hole in it. Right. You're going to hold that tool in your hand between your thumb and your forefinger where it closes. I would have my thumb over the blade so you can control it. You're going to push the cable through the body of this and there's a hole in the bottom where the palm of your hand is, and then you squeeze it down six or eight inches and then at the end. you're pulling it towards you. Pull it out, and then it just scores a tiny, tiny strip down the outer cable. And sometimes you have to peel it apart, mm -hmm. but you don't want that blade too long because you don't want to nick the insulation on the individual wires. So you can't do it too hard or... Well, it's designed not to, but I would say with these very cheap ones, that thin metal, you know, if you have it in your toolbox and you're dropping hammers and pipe right. wrenches on it, you can actually flatten it out and mm. you, you risk that. So I would say for a couple dollars more, you can get a little better cable ripper and it's solid plastic and you just put your cable in here, you tilt it at an angle and pull it and you'll get an exact cut. Mm. Once you cut back the outer sheathing, you're going to peel it back and cut it off with your wire strippers or diagonal pliers. Mm -hmm. And if you're wrapping the individual wires around screw terminals, you're going to cut off about three quarters of an inch of the insulation on the individual wire. And then you're going to connect it under the screw terminal, create a loop clockwise mm -hmm. because you're going to be wrapping it clockwise under a screw terminal. If you're connecting wires under a wire connector, you're only going to remove about a half an inch of the insulation and put it underneath a wire connector. When you're purchasing your wire for a project, you want to look at the breaker or the fuse that you're working on for that circuit at your service panel. For a 15 amp circuit, you're going to be using 14 gauge wire. For a 20 amp circuit, you're going to be using 12 gauge wire. And you want to make sure that you're always matching your wire to the circuit. Why for, is for a 15 amp, why isn't it just 15 gauge? Yeah, that'd have been simple, wouldn't hey, it? What, right? <laughs> 20 amp, 20 gauge, yeah. 30. Yeah. So the wire, the smaller the number, the you know the more current it can hold. Mm, it's so stupid. <laughs> yeah. For most projects, you're going to be using a two-wire cable with a ground. And if you're adding an additional outlet, let's say, to a circuit with a 15 amp breaker, you'd be purchasing a 14-2 cable with ground. You're going to have a black wire, a white wire, and a bare ground wire. So that's a 14-2? 14-2 with ground. So you can get 14-2 without a ground, and then the 14-2 with ground always so get the ground. Two? For, two wires. But so, there's really so four, three wires. So f right. Well, well two, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, don't you love the hardware so is there, terms? Is there, is there a 14-3? <laughs> 
Sure. Yeah. So fourteen three. So let's. So say, does it have four wires in there? Yes. Yeah. So you're so a fourteen three. You're going to have a black wire, a red wire, a white wire, and then a bare ground wire. So four wires. In a fourteen three, three with with ground. So so with the ground is your extra one. So, but <laughs> stupid. <laughs> I go back to my original statement. <laughs> In some areas of the country, like Chicago and Seattle, you're going to have to run individual wires and metal conduit. So right. you, you can't even use Romex or non-metallic cable in some communities. So Which makes sense to me. Right. <laughs> but then in all parts of the country, if you have exposed indoor projects, let's say we're running outlets in an unfinished basement, mm-hmm. you're going to run individual wires inside metal conduit. Unless your community says that you can use it in PVC plastic pipe. But you need rigid conduit. And with the rigid pipe, it's called RNC, or rigid non-metallic conduit. Right. And with this plastic conduit, you can cut the pipe to length with a saw, usually like either a hand saw or a hack saw. You're going to clean off and deburr the edges so you don't damage the insulation Mm -hmm. on the individual wires while you pull it through. And then you just connect it to your fittings with regular PVC glue. Hmm. And what's great about the electrical conduit that's plastic is you don't have to use a primer. By code, you can just get away with PVC glue. Again, check your local community. Right. But for non-metallic conduit electrical projects, it's very easy. Hmm. If you're running metal conduit, you need to use metal boxes. Mm-hmm. And if you're in how do you cut metal conduit? So just with a hacksaw, cuts mm-hmm. easy, and then make sure that you're reaming it out, that you don't have it, you're deburring it. There's no burrs in there. If you're in Chicago or Seattle and have conduit throughout your house and it goes all the way back to the service panel, you may not be running a ground wire. So the conduit and the boxes are grounded all the way from the service panel, and each outlet or switch is grounded when you screw it into the metal box. Seems so which is... much safer to me. <laughs> well, you know, as long as all your fittings are tight. and you, right. and you, If you've done the job right, mm-hmm. it's easy, right. and it is safe. But, you know, I, I mean, you do run that risk of somebody not, you know, connecting it properly because you need a continuous connection of metal all the way back to right. the service panel where it's grounded. If you have Romex in your home and you're running a length of conduit, let's say in an unfinished basement, you're doing a project, you have to use a grounding whip and connect a ground wire. So this grounding whip is a short wire with a screw connected to it, and mm-hmm. you screw it into the back of a metal box and then you attach the ground wire from the cable to this, and then from that connection underneath a wire connector, you're going to run a little pigtail to whatever the device is, a switch or an outlet. So this is like just a little six-inch short length of green or bare copper, and that's going to ground it now, and it's all going to be connected and grounded safely all the way back to the service panel. So if you didn't ground... ground... Well, the grounding whips sometimes are by the wire connectors, but sometimes they're also by the switches. GFCIs. And, and you're usually going to see it in a little package, either right. of two or sometimes they have 12. Mm-hmm. And it's almost always, I think I've only ever seen it in 12-gauge wire. So you can use this for 14-gauge or 12-gauge mm-hmm. application. For most projects inside your house, you're going to be using EMT, and that stands for Electrical Metallic Tubing. And this is the lightest of the conduit. Mm-hmm. Very easy to use to install. It comes with a wide variety of elbows and offsets now. Right. So you can usually do a whole run without having to bend any pipe. Hmm. Like when I first started investing in real estate, it was amazing to watch some of these electricians and they would have these pipe benders and they would create all these offsets and angles. And and it was a, a learning curve yeah. to be able to get that down. And now you've got a, a lot of different fittings that you can get. So So very few people now know how to bend tubing. And that EMT, it's going to come in 10-foot sticks. You're going to cut it with a hacksaw. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to be connecting it to the metal boxes with fittings. So you've got a set screw on one side that's going to hold that fitting to the pipe. In most cases, sometimes they have compression fittings too. And then that fitting is going to go into the electrical box, and there's a lock nut that you spin onto it. Right. Most people are going to use a slotted screwdriver and tap the little tabs on the outside of that nut mm-hmm. and tighten it down. Or... Gardner Bender just came out with a lock nut wrench no way. that you can tighten down. Yeah, it's super cool. So mm-hmm. it's this little tiny handheld wrench, and now you can tighten it rather than taking a screwdriver in there. 
When you're working with the conduit, you can buy a metal deburring tool, which mm -hmm. is nice to have, but you can also, if you have linesman pliers, the nose of it, or the, the jaw of the linesman plier, is actually beveled and designed to go into the conduit, and you turn it, hmm. and you can deburr it with the linesman plier, so just a handy tool to have, and it really grabs wires nice, it has really nice knives on there to cut cable and wires too. So if you're doing a lot of work with conduit, I would have a nice pair of linesman pliers. How many wires can you pull through conduit? Is there like a limit? So there's definitely a limit by code and then depends on the size. So for most home projects, you're probably going to be using half inch EMT mm -hmm. or three quarter inch EMT. And you're usually just going to be dealing with 14 and 12 gauge wire. With half inch EMT, you can get 12 14 gauge wires in there, hmm. which seems like a lot. Yeah. You can get nine 12 gauge wires, and then with three quarter inch EMT, you can get 22 14 <laughs> gauge wires and 16 12 gauge wires. Wow, that's a lot of work. Yeah, that's like a lot, a lot of pulling wire. Flexible metal conduit is the spiral of interlocking flexible metal conduit, so it's either filled with wires or it's going to be empty. So this and, is the stuff that comes on a roll. Right, exactly. And this is for a short section of pipe where you need a flexible connection. Let's mm -hmm. say you're connecting electric to a garbage disposal or a water heater from a metal box. Right. And it's just so much easier than running straight conduit and a bunch of turns, a mm -hmm. bunch of fittings. And it can be called armored cable, so it can be marked AC or it can be marked metal clad MC. But most people are going to call it BX or Greenfield. Where the heck does BX so, come from? So this was developed in the early 1900s by Henry Greenfield. Mm -hmm. And his first invention was called Product A Experimental. So he called it AX. Huh. And then his second product, and the one he patented, was Product B Experimental. So <laughs> BX for short. How do these things stick around? <laughs> Funny. And and it's funny, like you talk to a lot of electricians, it's like, hey, you know, let's use some BX here, or let's use some Greenfield right. here. And, you know, it's it started in the 1900s. <laughs> but you can only use short sections of this, right? Really depends on your community. But, you know, like in some of the suburbs where, you know, we've done projects, you're limited to a six foot section, mm -hmm. so six feet to an appliance, and the rest has to be solid. But, you know, check if you're going to, let's say, a ceiling fan, they'll let you use a longer section. Right. But again, each community is a little different. Hmm. If you're buying a pre-cut package of cable and it's marked MC, that cable inside is going to have your hot wire, your neutral wire, and you're going to have a full-size green colored wire hmm. inside there. Anything marked AC is going to just have a thin aluminum bonding strip as the ground. There's not going to be a green wire. Interesting. So, so I like the MC. And to cut flexible metal conduit, you want Good to use... Luck. you. <laughs> it's It's brutal. If you have this tool called an armored cable cutter, mm -hmm. it clamps onto the cable, and then you turn this handle, and it cuts through a section, a spiral of the flexible metal, right. and then you can bend it back and forth and separate it, mm -hmm. and then you're going to pull away the armored cable, and then it's going to expose your wire, and then you're going to cut that and trim it down. Or you can use a hacksaw you're going to cut at an angle to kind of cut through one of those sections. And you want to be careful because if you cut too deep, you can right. nick, nick the wire underneath. And then you're going to bend this back and forth to separate it. This or, was painful to watch you do, by right. the way. <laughs> <laughs> or you can grab the flexible metal conduit and pull it together and crimp it and kink it. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to get the little spirals to unkink right. in one area. And then you're going to use diagonal pliers and go after it and cut it and pull away the end. But it's, it can be tough, and then you want to make sure that you're either using pliers or your diagonal pliers, and if you have a rough, sharp edge, you want to bend that back and straighten it up. And there, you're always going to be using these plastic anti-short bushings, and you're going to protect the end of this metal so that it doesn't nick the right. individual wires inside. Because that's bad. <laughs> right, right. And make sure that you're matching this plastic bushing to the size of the cable. Mm -hmm. Another cable you might use for projects around the house is UF cable. So this is underground feeder cable and it's used outside, completely waterproof, and that outer sheathing completely surrounds each individual wire. So it's definitely much more difficult to rip off this outer sheathing than compared to like a non-metallic cable. Mm -hmm. I would run an extra inch or two of cable if I'm running it into a box, or let's say we're stripping the outer sheath first. Mm -hmm. the and inch or so of the cable, I would run three slots. Let's say that we're using a two-wire cable with a ground. 
I would cut on the top of each wire on one side, I'd flip it over and I'd use a utility knife and cut three slits through the outer sheath on the other side and then peel it open so I can get that ground wire. Hmm. I'm going to hold the sheath or the cable with one hand and then with a pair of pliers I'm going to grab just the end of that ground wire and pull it back. Let's say I want to remove six or eight inches. I'm going to pull it back eight inches. So you're like splitting it open? Splitting it open through the center and now I'm going to work out let's say the black wire. Mm -hmm. I'll grab the cable again with my hand, grab the black wire with my pliers and then pull it back to the same distance mm -hmm. and then do the same with the white. And you've kind of destroyed that last inch where you're, you've cut it, you've used right. pliers on it and now I'll just take diagonal pliers or my wire strippers and cut off mm -hmm. that inch from the end of those three, cut off my sheathing, and that's kind of the easiest way to do it. Interesting. And the UF cable is good for projects. Let's say you're running cable out to a light that you're putting you know, outside or to a garage or a shed. I would run it in PVC. Some of this is designed, this, this underground feeder is designed to just be trenched into the ground, and it can be just covered with dirt in many communities, so which, which seems crazy. So you're digging a hole. Right. You're digging and, a long trench. Right. And you're just uh, well, dumping 120 volt electricity <laughs> in the ground. Well, if you move into a new house, you don't know what's under right. the ground. Yeah, now. so I would always use either Schedule 40 PVC or Schedule 80 is thicker. Right. And, and much more solid and more durable. And just run conduit all the way out to whatever your and again, projects you are. You hit something, you stop. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah I like covering stuff. <laughs> The most common type of electrical boxes you're going to be using for remodeling around the house are either going to be a single or double gang box. What's a gang? And so a single gang box is holding one device, so just one switch or one outlet. Where did a, this word come from? I, I, yeah, because one's not really a gang. <laughs> and a double gang is going to hold two devices. A single gang box is rectangular, usually two inches by three inches or two inches by four inches. Mm -hmm. A double gang is square and it's usually four inches by four inches. Plastic boxes are used in most communities, but check with your village, especially if you're in Chicago or the Seattle area. And then if you're nailing or screwing a box into a stud, let's say you're, you've removed the drywall on mm -hmm. a project you're doing, you want to use a scrap piece of drywall to orient the front edge of the box flush with the face of the drywall. It oh. can't be set back. It's got right. to be even with the face of the drywall. What I like about plastic boxes is they're marked with the maximum number of wires allowed. So if you see 9-14 or 8-12, it's saying that you can get 9 14 gauge wires or 8 12 gauge wires in there. Okay. And the bigger the box, the better. If, if you're buying for a project, you don't want to overcrowd a box. Right. And this allows you to have more wire, a little bit longer wire, so that when you fold it and tuck it back in the box, you've got more to work with if you've got a bigger box. And then if you're adding big devices, let's say you're putting in a GFCI one day or an AFCI or a dimmer, right. I just like having a lot of room in a box when I'm working with it. If you're adding a 4 inch by 4 inch box as a junction box, so you're running multiple cables to this to mm -hmm. multiple areas, it needs to have a blank cover plate on it and be accessible. You can never cover a box, even if you've used it for a junction box and there's no switch or an outlet on it, mm -hmm. it's got to be accessible. You can't cover it with drywall, tile, or paneling. Well, that's interesting. If you plan on putting up a ceiling fan, you need to make sure that you have an electrical box rated for ceiling fans, and it's going to be marked with for ceiling fan support or something similar to that, right. but it's going to say on it for ceiling fans. And if you have a very heavy light fixture, let's say you have a chandelier that's very heavy, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're using a ceiling fan rated box, and look at the weight limits because it's also going to be marked on the box. All these boxes kind of look the same, don't they? Yeah, which is wild. If you're down that aisle, you really need to kind of pay attention to what you're looking for. And hopefully so... everybody put it back in the right spot. Too. <laughs> right, right. But if you're reading it, like, right. like with the plastic boxes, how many wires. And then just go deep, you know, just kind of be goof-proof. Get a bigger box with ceilings, you know, get these ceiling fan rated boxes. And then to add a ceiling fan box without having to remove the drywall on, on the ceiling, mm -hmm. you can purchase a ceiling fan brace kit. So this is going to come with a brace, and it's expandable. comes with a ceiling fan rated box. I would use a stud finder to find the joist, and then you're going to put this in between that. Right. And then you're going to use your box as a template. You're going to cut out the hole between mm -hmm. the joists. You're going to insert this brace up and into that hole, set it on the drywall. It's going to have feet, so it spaces the brace perfectly for your box. And then you're going to start twisting this brace 
and it's going to expand between the joists and there's going to be teeth on the sides of this brace that are going to grab and anchor into the joists and then you're going to pull your wire through mm -hmm. you're going to push it through your box and then you're going to use a bracket and attach the box to your brace and one of the top rated is the Westinghouse safety brace mm -hmm. and it's and safety is SAF dash T dash brace <laughs> and this is going to support a 70 pound ceiling fan or up to a hundred and fifty pound light fixture wow. if you have 16 inch on center joist <laughs> when you're putting cable into a plastic box you don't want to break that tab that covers the hole that you're pushing that cable through you do or you don't you don't because that tab is actually going to help grab hold of the cable oh. and you want to leave at least a quarter inch of that sheathing as mm -hmm. it enters into the box by code so you're and not nicking it so you're not so yeah it's going to protect the individual wires so right. they don't overflex and then it also gives that tab something else to grab onto it and then it really depends on the box some are going to have those tabs and some will have a screw down clamp hmm. to hold the cable if you have a project where you want to add an electrical box but you don't want to remove the drywall you can buy a box that's either called old work or retrofit or remodel box hmm. and this can be installed between the studs so again it's nice to have a stud finder and these are going to have tabs on the face of the box that holds it to the front of the drywall right. and then you have these flip out tabs on the back side that tighten with a screwdriver and so those tabs are going to grab the drywall on both sides hmm. so just very easy to put in great these are even good for if you're running speaker wire or, or let's say cable wire right. and you want to have it onto a box and a, and a plate if you're putting in light switches they're usually going to be about 42 inches from the floor outlets are usually about 12 inches from the floor but i would use the existing devices so that you have a uniform look and then if you're it would be kind of funny if they were all different heights. staggered artistic yes <laughs> what was that movie with larry david clear history i think it's called right, right. where he wanted all the outlets at eye level so he didn't have to bend over yes yeah, so, well so it's because it's always like behind a sofa right, yeah. or a chair yeah yeah yeah, Larry, Larry David would be a great electrician. <laughs> if you're working on a project and you're adding new tile or paneling or some other material to your wall, you need to use an electrical box extender mm -hmm. to adjust the device to the material because you don't want your, let's say, a switch or an outlet set back below right. the, the face of this. And this extender is a body, so it's it looks like an electrical box without a front or a back to it. Right. And it's tapered. So not so much a box. <laughs> <laughs> right four sides and <laughs> it's slightly smaller so it's going to slide inside the old box mm -hmm. what you're going to do is you're going to remove the device so let's say an outlet you're going to put your material on your wall you're going to slide this extender box into the old box and the face sets flush with the new material right. so there's little tabs in front that catch it and the the extender is going to come with new screws that are longer you're going to run these through your device, through the extender, the holes in this extender, and then it runs into the holes in the old box, keeping your device flush with the new material mm -hmm. you have. And then you're going to put your cover plate over this, and it's going to fit perfectly. When you're connecting wires together, use wire connectors. Make sure they're sized for the amount and the gauge of the wire you're using. Mm -hmm. So check the label. Which uh, wire connectors, there's a lot of different sizes. Yes. So and make, colors for some reason. Right. So make sure you're matching them up properly and use a wire connector with a spring inside so as you tighten it down on wires that spring slightly opens up it your wires twist under it and mm -hmm. then when you release it it closes down and holds them more securely than wire connectors without the spring and then especially when you're connecting solid wire to stranded wire right so let's say you have your household wire and you're connecting it to the ceiling fan wires or mm -hmm. light wires it's it the spring is really going to make it much more secure and you can also use linesman pliers to give solid wire a turn or two and flatten them out before twisting it clockwise under wire connectors. Hmm. But the wire connector, it, it's actually designed to twist the wires together without any pre-twisting. Interesting. And for your outdoor projects, you can get weatherproof wire connectors. Hmm. So these are filled with 100% silicone and they have a little seal on the end. You force your wires through that seal and twist it down and after 24 hours, it's a completely waterproof connection. Didn't you take one of these apart once? <laughs> yeah, I cut one in half. <laughs> and there really is silicone inside. 
if you need to pick up wire strippers for your electrical projects, I would get a quality wire stripper, and you can get one for probably $10 to $15, right. and you're not going to be aggravated. If you pick up these inexpensive wire strippers... Like they, a dollar oh, they're, ones. They're, they're ter- They do not work. They're garbage, and they'll either cut too shallow, so you're trying to rip off the outer mm-hmm. insulation, or they cut too deep and nick well, the wires. Well, some of them don't cut at all. Right. So get a quality wire stripper, and it'll last you a lifetime. It'll do a great job for you. Do you have some top-rated companies? Klein, Gardner Bender, Irwin, Hacko, and it's H-A-K-K-O, Milwaukee, Capri, and Knipex. Mm -hmm. So I talked to one of the reps. I always thought it was Knipex. Yeah. And it's K-N-I-P-E-X, and they pronounce it Knipex. Mm, Fancy. (laughs) Do you have anything else to add? Always turn off the electric to any circuit you're working yeah, on. Yeah, you did say that once. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wrap right there. Get a quality wire stripper and turn off the electric. There you go. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, or iHeartRadio. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. Our book three should be out this week or next week, and we'll release uh, just a short podcast. You'll be the first to know. (laughs) And it's going to be free (laughs) for five days. Yeah, not forever, but for five days. (laughs) You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Do you have a tip of this? Do you have a tip of this? Do you have a tip of this?